Aren't you thankful for the blood tonight? We started off this morning's service singing about the name of Jesus and tonight about the blood. Boy, those two are what gives us victory and overcoming power. Praise God. Thank the Lord for his blessings upon us for the service this morning. I believe God has a blessing for us tonight. Would you stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Let's remember those that are sick in body. Continue to pray for Jeff Bremer. Uh, the Lord touched him, and he's doing better today, much better today than he was yesterday. He still has a way to go. He's halfway through his treatments. Pray God will continue to strengthen him and heal him and deliver him. I'm looking forward to hearing his testimony when he gets back to church. So pray for him. Pray for Stephen Smith the third tonight, uh, Stephen Shelley's son. He needs healing. He needs guidance. He is, um, they may have to re remove part of his heel. He's in a very serious need of God's touch tonight. Pray for him. Continue to pray for my wife. The Lord will strengthen her. She's getting some better. She's still very weak, and she is wanting me to express to you how much she appreciates your prayers and all the text and cards that you have sent to her. It means so much to her. Thank you very much for remembering her. And uh, continue to pray for others that are sick today. Joanne Nance has asked us for special prayer for her, that God would touch her. And there's just so many folks that are in need, that needs God's healing touch and delivering power. The Salcedos, Troy and Abby have, are both sick. Pray God would touch them and keep the children well. And uh, let's pray for the many people that came back from the General Assembly. There were so many that came back sick. And uh, pray for them. One of our pastor's sister passed away just the other day. She was only 61 years old. Came back from the assembly, got very sick and died. Pray for him. Brother Kearney Wilkes and pastors in Marion. Pray God would give them strength. Do you have any unspoken requests tonight by lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these needs and pray for this service. Pray for God to bless tonight. Our Father, we're so thankful to you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We magnify you and exalt you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us and keeping your hand upon us. We ask your blessings upon all these needs tonight, every name that's been called, every problem, every sickness, every situation. We know, God, you're able to intervene. You're able to change and transform. You're able to do great and mighty things that we know not. We ask you to convict the hearts of those that are lost, that they'll not rest till they call upon your name to be saved. We invite your presence tonight. We pray that we'll leave this service rejoicing, blessing, and praising your name for all you've done. We give you all the glory. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you tonight. It's time to receive the tithes and offerings. In Philippians 4, 19, in the Amplified Version, it says, And my God will liberally supply, fill until full, your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now notice it doesn't say he's going to supply your every want. Uh, he, he knows the, the, the past, the present, and the future. He knows what his plan is for our life, and he's... Uh, there's been plenty of times I know where, where uh, I've prayed for something and, and um, I have to always catch myself and say, Lord, if that's your will, that's what I want. If it's, not what you, if it's not your will, then close the door. And it's amazing how you look back later on and say, wow, like if, if I hadn't prayed that way and, I've, and, and he granted that, um, something that was way better never would have been able to happen. And so... Um, 
so God is, is faithful to, um, to supply our every need. And then the other thing that uh, is striking is it says he will liberally supply, fill until full. So he's not just pouring out uh, a sprinkle here or there. He's, it's when, when it's in accordance with his will, he's going to you know, pour out the fountain. And, um, and, and in terms of our tithes and offerings, if he's, he's been so good to us and supplied all of our needs abundantly, um, and everything we have is from him, how can we not give back to him generously? Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you that you load us up with benefits every day. Thank you that, that you know the, the future and that you know what your will and your plan is for our lives and that, um, and that you're in control of all that and and that you don't grant the wishes and the, and the prayers that we have that aren't in accordance with your will. We pray that you would just take these tithes and offerings, that you would multiply them and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask it all in your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could we all stand all over the house? of the Lord tonight. How many know that we serve a great and mighty God? Amen. He is great. Yeah. Great and mighty is He. Lord, we worship you tonight. Sing this with us. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. serve a great Hallelujah. and mighty God. He's Hallelujah. great. How great is our God. He's our King. He's our Lord. And one day every knee is going to bow before Him in reverence and awe. Even the ones that wouldn't bow before are going to have to bow when He comes. Aren't you looking forward to that day? Let's worship our great and mighty God tonight.
again. Let's worship him in his greatness tonight. finite mind can't even begin to comprehend your greatness. He is so great. He is so mighty. He's beyond my comprehension. And I worship him tonight. I thank him for his goodness and his blessings. Thank him for what he has done, for what he is doing. He is a mighty God. And he's worthy and deserving of all our praise and our worship. Thank you singers and musicians. Thank you so very much. Just remain standing, if you will, for the reading of the word. I want to read two verses of scripture found in the book of Amos chapter 8 verses 11 through 12. Amos chapter 8 verses 11 through 12. Behold the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I want to speak tonight on the subject God wants to end the famine in your life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Father, that we are blessed, that we are privileged to be able to hear your word and receive instruction and direction and correction. We thank you, Father, that we are able to feel your presence and to know, Lord, that you are preparing us for that glorious day of your appearing. Help us tonight, Lord, to be able to have the faith that we need to believe, to trust, and obey, to walk in the Spirit, to walk in the light, to be led of the Spirit, 
to be anointed of the Holy Ghost. I pray tonight, God, that ears would hear and hearts would receive. And we'll all be blessed. We'll all leave tonight rejoicing for the great and mighty things that you have done. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. For it's in the lovely and holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. A famine is described as a scarcity or a deficiency of anything. There can be a famine of just about anything that we can think of. But in this chapter, God had pronounced judgment upon Israel and judgment was soon to come. He showed Amos the prophet a bowl of, or a basket of ripe fruit. And he said that ripe fruit was symbolic or representative that judgment was ripe, that judgment was soon to come because God's patience had run out with the wickedness in the land. The merchants were keeping the religious feast, but they were not keeping them in spirit. They were keeping the festivals, but they weren't keeping them in spirit. They couldn't wait for the holy days or the Sabbath days to be over so that they could go back to making money like so many people these days that can't wait for the church service to be over so they can go back to their living and go back to their life. All they were really interested in was doing better for themselves and even cheating others in order to get ahead. Their hearts were not in worship. And how many of you know you've got to put your heart into worship? You've got to worship God with all your heart. You've got to give God all your attention. You can't be half-hearted. You can't be lukewarm. You've got to be committed when it comes to worshiping God. And their hearts were not in worship. They were simply putting on a religious show and doing this for others to make others think that they were so religious, that they were a spiritual people. But God knew their hearts. God knows our hearts. We can say, we can project, we can put on a charade, and we can pretend all we please, but God is the one who knows. His eyes are like fire, and he sees through all the facade and all the veneer and all the pretense he sees our heart and he knows what's going on on the inside. And God knew their hearts and it displeased him. The people did not have an appetite for the word of God. So God said, I'm going to take the word of God away from you. Now there's many scriptures that talks about famines and drought in the word of God. We know about the seven year famine in Egypt when during the days of Joseph. But Egypt had plenty because Pharaoh listened to the wise, the wise words of Joseph. We know about the three-year famine during the time of David. And we know about the terrible famine in 2 Kings 7. It was so devastating that two of the women made a pact to boil and eat their children. So these were famines that we read about in the word. And as terrible as that is, as terrible as it is to have a scarcity of food and extreme hunger, as terrible as that is, he says a scarcity or a famine for the word of God is even worse. Because when you're having problems, you've got to have the word for direction. When trouble comes, you've got to hear what the Lord is saying. He's got the answer because he is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. So we've got to have the word of God. And God said there's going to be a famine during the days of Amos, a famine for the word of God. Sometimes we don't appreciate what we have until we don't have it anymore. Sometimes we don't appreciate the blessings of God until those blessings are removed. And the people no longer had a hunger for the word of God. They no longer had a hunger or a thirst 
for the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm going to remove the word from the land. And then there came a time when they desired the word, but they could not find it. He said, they're going to go from sea to sea, from north to east, searching for the word of God, but they will not find it. I hope we realize tonight just how important the word of God is to us. It is our resource. It is our source of our faith. Our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we don't have faith, we don't have anything. We've got to have faith to believe. If we have faith to believe, all things are possible to him that believes. So if you're in a troubled situation, if you're in dire straits, if you're in desperate need, you can have faith in what God has said because you've heard the word. And when you hear the word and receive the word, it builds up your faith. It is our source of sustenance. It is our source of strength. It is our source of comfort. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 4 and 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need the word of God, especially in this day. I want to know what to do. I want to know what direction to take. I want to know what solution there is. I want to know the help that I need. And I can turn to the word of God and find that God is an ever present help in trouble. We're suffering a spiritual famine today. How could it be possible though that we're suffering a spiritual famine when 71% of Americans identify themselves as Christian? How could we be suffering a famine when we have churches on almost every corner there's a smorgasbord of churches where you can pick and choose who has the best gymnasium who has the best drama who has the best after school who has the best daycare who has the best of this who has the best of that and people travel around the circuit going here and going there looking for a different church that they can find what tickles their fancy what we need to find is a place where we can hear the word of God it's not the, the exercise it's not the social gatherings that's going to help us during a time of crisis it's going to be the word of God when somebody will say preacher would you give me the word of God would you tell me what the spirit is saying to the church would you tell me what God has laid on your heart would you tell me what the Lord is saying to us we need to hear the word of the Lord how could there be a famine when there's so many people who claim to have a word from God how could there be a famine when there's so many self-proclaimed apostles and prophets who never seem to be short of a prophetic word? There's a whole lot of religiosities in the world today. In fact, we've never seen people as religious as they are today. Everybody claims to have some sort or some type of religion. But Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 5 said that they will have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There's no substance to their religion. There's no life to their religion. The whole of religion it seems has become shallow and has become empty. They have a form but they don't have any fire. They have a program but they don't have any power. They have a service but they don't have any substance. They have motion but they don't have any emotion. There's something that's empty. Something that is missing. Something is going to rise. And oh, how we need to get back to the old-fashioned days of praying and singing and preaching and magnifying the Lord. The church is not a social gathering. The church is not an entertainment center. The church is a house of worship where we worship Almighty God and He comes down and ministers to His people where hearts are changed, where conviction falls and people are afraid to leave until they pray through and get rid of their sins we need to get back to the word of God and back to the preaching of the word and singing the word and magnifying the name of the Lord Ezekiel said this is what's happening Ezekiel 33 31 and they come unto thee as the people cometh and they sit before thee as my people 
and they hear the words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetous. He said they come to church, they sit before the people, they sit in the crowd just like everybody else. They even hear the word like everybody else. And he said with their mouths they speak it, they talk much love, but he said then they don't do the word of God. What did Jesus say about hearing the word and not doing the word? He said, it's like a man that has built his house on the sand. When the rains come and the floods rise, the house is going to fall. But if you hear the word and you do the word, you're a wise man that's built his house on the rock that when the rains fall and the winds blow and the floods rise, your house is gonna stand because it's on a sure foundation. He wants us to hold on to the word of God and to do the word of God and walk in obedience to the word. But the Lord rebuked the people in Isaiah 58, he rebuked them because of their false worship. If there's anything I want to be, I want to be genuine. I don't want to be fake and phony. When we come before God, we better not be fake and phony. We better be genuine. Just lay it all out before God and say, God, I know you have an all-seeing eye. You know me inside and out and upside down. You know my past, my present, my future. There's no need for me to try to come to you with any pretense or any put on or any charade. I come to you, God, as an open book. You know every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm open before you. And oh, when you bury your face in a rug and say, God, have mercy on me. You know the frailty of my frame. You know that I'm weak and frail. But oh God, it's your spirit that gives me strength that will bear me up and lift me up. He has cleansing power. He has delivering power. We can pray until we pray through and experience the power and the presence of God if we're true and we're genuine with what we're saying. They went to the temple every day. They made a show of going to the house of God. They made it known that they were fasting, but God wasn't impressed. God's not impressed with all the phony baloney. He's not impressed with all the pretense and the charades and the performances and the programs. God's not impressed with that. He wants somebody who will worship him in spirit and in truth, who is sincere in their worship. God was not impressed. They acted religious. They put on the religious show. They were so pious the way they acted, but then they were still fighting. They were still quarreling with one another. They were still oppressing their workers. They were good at religious charades. They were good at putting on a front and a show Why they could hoop and holler with the best of them. But they never stood for anything. They never stood for the word of God. There's a lot of chameleon Christians these days who agree with anybody and everybody about everything. There's a lot of chameleon Christians these days that go along to get along. They don't want to rock the boat. These are days when we're feeling it, we're sensing it, we're seeing it, when we're going to be more under attack than ever before. You speak the word of God, you stand upon the word of God, and somebody's going to rail against you. I mean viciously, ugly things that people will say. You've got to make up your mind. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they call me. It doesn't, what, doesn't matter what name they put on me. I'm going to stand for the word of God. True believers are going to hold on to the doctrine. They're going to contend for the faith. They're not going to waver or vacillate. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You say, this is what I believe. I believe it based on the word of God, not man's opinion not by what the culture is telling us to believe. I believe what this book says. I believe the word of God. How am I going to know what the word says unless I hear it preached, unless I hear it taught, unless I read it, unless I listen to it? How am I going to know? We need to be full of the word of God because when the devil comes against you, you're not going to defeat him with an opinion. You're not going to defeat him with something you read in a magazine somewhere. You're going to defeat him with the word of God because God's word is forever settled and God's word is quick and powerful and God's word is a sword that we defeat the devil with. You can defeat the devil and live a victorious life through the word of God. True believers are gonna hold on to the word. If you believe God's word, stand up for it. 
Don't be a chameleon Christian. I'm afraid somebody's going to criticize you or somebody's going to shun you if you stand for the word of God. Don't try to blend in with any and everybody and get along with everybody, but stand on the word. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be different. Dare to stand up and say, this is what I believe, and God will be with you, and he'll give you the boldness of a lion and the strength of an eagle and the backbone that you need to stand. God, help us not to be a jelly backbone and noodle need. Help us not to be wimpy and, and shy and backward when it comes to the word of God. Let us stand on the word and say, I've got all of heaven with me. I've got the Father with me. I've got the Son with me. I've got the Holy Ghost with me. I've got angels in camp round about me. I've I've got all the authority of heaven. I don't have to be afraid of the devil or anything in this world because the word will stand the test of time. The Lord told them the fast that they had chosen was not the fast he had chosen. The fast he had chosen was for them to share the bread with the hungry. James puts it this way in James 1, 26, 27. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceive of his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. There's a lot of people that, that do a lot of talking. They've talked away all their victory. They've talked away all the relationship they've had with God. Gossiping and backbiting and backstabbing. He said that person is not a religious person. They're not spiritual person. He said if and he seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, his religion is in vain. He's deceived his own heart. That's the worst deception there is to deceive ourselves when you think you're to be something when you're nothing. You've deceived your own heart, the Bible says. We don't want to deceive ourselves. We want to be honest before God. If there's anything that God wants us to be is to be honest with him. You can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool God. You can fool mom and dad. You can fool brother and sister. You can fool people in the church, but you can't fool God. He knows the secrets of our heart. He knows everything there is to know about us. And the Lord said, this is in vain. You can talk a good talk, but you're failing miserably in your walk. It's not good enough to talk the talk. James says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's a reason for all this unrest that's going on in the world. I don't know. Does anybody else sense it besides me? Does anybody else feel like the... The earth is just going into convulsions. I mean, it's just something, one thing after another. There is, there is no shortage of hurting, oppressed, depressed, addicted, unsaved, backslidden, confused, and abused people. There's no shortage. Everywhere you turn, you see people going through something. Things are just tearing people apart, tearing their lives apart, tearing, tearing their families apart, tearing churches apart. It seems that people are wandering near and far, trying to find relief from all these things that are happening. Where's the relief at? You can't find it in the world. The world doesn't have relief. The famine has come because of the rejection of the Spirit of God and of the Word of God. You know, people, they, they, they look at, at the preacher and they look at the church and they look at the word as being old-fashioned and fuddy-duddy and archaic and, and not relevant for today. But, oh, judgment is coming, God said to Amos. Judgment is ripe. It's coming. It's about to come. You can sense it. I believe every child of God, anybody that's in a relationship with God can sense it in their spirit that something is about to happen, something is about to take place and the famine is in the land because of the rejection of the Spirit of God. Back when the pestilence just hit, when the pestilence just started in the world, we had people calling the church and they said, Pastor, I want to start paying my tithes. Pastor, would you pray for me? People got scared because they sensed that something it was in the end days and the end of times and they, they sensed it but as time has gone on, they just kind of waned away. Some said, I'm going to get back to church 
church, Pastor. I haven't given up on the church, and that's been a couple of years ago, and they're still not back. What happens is you can harden your heart until you're no longer sensitive to what the Spirit of God is saying. God, help us not to harden our heart. Help us not to get to the place, oh, that we can't no longer shed tears to where we're no longer trembling in the presence of God. Help us not to become callous and say, that's just what that preacher says. That's just what that church believes. And I've heard it before. It's not going to happen. I want to tell you just as sure as I'm standing here tonight, his word is going to be fulfilled and his will is going to be accomplished. God's word will not fail. The famine has come. As Jesus lamented as he cried over Jerusalem in Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, he cried. Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sin unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings and you would not. You refused. Proverbs 1, 25, such a, such a stir, disturbing passage of scripture there. He said, but you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. You would not listen to anything that I said. There's a famine in the land and God is asking, where are my intercessors? Where are my witnesses? Where are my people? Where are my watchmen? Watchmen, what of the night they would cry? What's, what's happening? When, when is the day going to dawn? And people used to ask what's happening, what's going on, but today everybody's trying to, to, uh, to go to a place to where they can just forget about what's happening. They go into denial and say this is not really happening. We're seeing it. We're seeing it in real time time, the word of God being fulfilled. You see Russia, you see Gog and Magog, you see the problems in China, the, the red dragon rising up, you see the troubles in the Middle East, you see the problems in the government, you see the corruption that's all around us, you see sickness, disease and pestilence, earthquakes, you see all these things and famines that are happening and people say well there's no big deal. I want to tell you God said these are signs and when you see these signs you better start looking up you better make preparation you better get ready because your redemption draweth nigh don't get adjusted here don't get attached here we're about to leave this world behind he says when we turn away from him we're turning away from our resources from that place of reservoir of blessings that reservoir of resources is from him that all blessings flow. When we're no longer drawing from the well of living water, we have nothing to offer anyone else. When we're dry, we have nothing to give. We have nothing to set before them. As the man said when his friend came to visit with him, he said, I have nothing to set before him. We become broken cisterns that can hold no water. We become physicians without any value. Those who are destitute in this world, those who are in need, they're looking for some kind of solace, some kind of help, some kind of relief, and they turn to the world's means and methods because they don't see it in the church. They turn to the remedies. They turn to the relationships of the world trying to find relief from their trouble. They turn to addictions and hobbies and parties trying to find relief for their souls. But none of these things are going to satisfy. You cannot shove enough drugs into your body. You cannot indulge in enough pleasures to satisfy the emptiness in your soul. There's a, there's a vacuum, there's a shape within you that only God can feel. You were created to serve God. You were created for his pleasure. There's not anything in this world that's gonna satisfy that emptiness and longing in your soul except God. We need to get full of God and until he's overflowing in our life. When you get full of God, he'll cause your face to shine. He'll cause joy to be unspeakable. And uh, in your heart, he'll cause peace that passes understanding to overflow you. I want to tell you it's a joy to serve the Lord. It's not a drudgery. It's not a hardship. Nobody has to get a whip and beat me to the house of God. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I'd rather be here tonight than to be at some bar room 
I'd rather be here tonight than to be at some pleasure house. I'd rather be here tonight than to be anywhere else. Thank God I can be in church. I need this. I need the word of God. I need the fellowship of the saints. And the Lord said so. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. He said, as you see the day of the Lord coming, you better get to the house of God. You better worship. You better pray. You better seek his face because this thing's going to get rough. It's going to get shaking around here. It's going to get disturbing around here. What we've been hearing, we think we've heard the worst. No, it's going to get worse. Not going to get better. It's not going to ease up. It's not going to back off because there's a demonic spirit working in this world. Evil is all around us. The devil is on the loose. But one of these days, the Lord is going to send an angel and get a hold of that old serpent, that old devil, and going to chain him in the bottomless pit. What a day that's going to be when he shuts the devil up. Praise God. He says, the world is spending for that which does not satisfy. Isaiah 55 and 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not? The best the world has to offer is temporary. Temporary. Temporary happiness. You can go to Disney World and have temporary happiness until they've taken all your money. I heard them say this morning, I think the cost has gone up, uh, what, a thousand percent over the last few years, and they, they become woke now. They don't even want Walt Disney at Disney World anymore. That's the kind of world we're living in. They, they don't want you to, to, to be able to have, have any lasting thing because they want you to keep coming back, to come back to their well and spend some more money. It's temporary solutions, temporary happiness. Temporary, by its own definition, does not last. What the world has to offer, the best the world can offer you is temporary. Because the hungry will be hungry again. The thirsty will be thirsty again. The depressed will be depressed again. You can have a good day. You can have a good time. But then there's tomorrow. And you say, what am I going to do today? But every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day we get up and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This old world doesn't have that peace. They don't have that joy. They don't have what we have tonight because they're living in a spiritual famine for rejecting the word of God. The famine doesn't happen overnight. This thing didn't happen overnight. The famine comes after rejecting the word of God time and time and time again. Someone said that I'd been preaching now 51 years. Can you imagine? 51 years of preaching, preaching and preaching and preaching. Preaching the word of God. And I wonder how much of the word has fallen on good ground. How much of it has taken root? How much of it has landed and produced a harvest? But how much of it has fallen by the wayside? How much of it has fallen upon stony ground and falling among thorns? It often takes a great deal of suffering and a great deal of heartache before stubbornness and rebellion is broken. It takes us praying, God, whatever it takes, I don't want them to be lost. I want them to be saved. Bring them into misery. Let conviction keep them awake at night. Let them wake up dreaming about hell, knowing that they're on their way to hell, that they'll call upon the Savior to deliver them from hell. So this is what happens is when people resist the word of God, the Bible says they're getting into a domain, a realm that is, that is darkness and evil. He said that when we resist and we're rebellious, when we resist the potter, when we resist the shepherd, when we resist the refiner, when we resist the Holy Ghost baptizer, when we resist, we're in rebellion, and rebellion is as witchcraft. Instead of Saul for rebellion as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. I don't want to be rejected by God. I want to hear him and receive him. Jeremiah said it this way, but they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive his instruction. We whine and we complain about how tough life is, and yet we fail to humble ourselves before God. I tell you, there comes a time in your spiritual life when you've got to get tired of just going through the motions. 
when you got to get tired of just saying prayers and going to church, hearing a song and a sermon and going home. There has to be a time when you get to a place, just lock yourself off in a room and say, God, you've got me on your hands today. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to leave you alone until I pray through. We need that old-fashioned type of intercession and praying before God, humbling before him. He says this. He says in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, 14, these are the things that can happen. If I shut up heaven and there be no rain or if I command the locusts to devour the land or if I send pestilence among my people. When I send these things, but notice he gives the remedy. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. God is saying that we have something to do with the famine. We have something to do with it, that we can pray until the famine ends. We can pray until the heavens are open. We can pray until the rain falls on the dry ground and water on the thirsty. We can pray until the manna comes down from heaven. I believe prayer makes the difference. That's what we're doing around here on Wednesday night. We're singing and we're praying. We're praying and we're singing. We're praying that God will intercede and that God would intervene and God would help us to be able to lift us up on higher ground into heavenly places. We're in the last days. We're in the last moments of the last days. Our hearts are, t- are beating away for the last of the last moments. Our bodies are temporary. Our life on this earth, the Bible says, is nothing more than a vapor that appears for a little time, but eternity is forever and ever and ever. We better prepare to meet God and prepare for eternity. I want our music to come if they will. God wants to end the famine in your life. You've been trying to fill a void in your life without God. Well, you can't do it. It's left you feeling empty, unfulfilled, and distraught, and dissatisfied. God said, I can end the famine in your life. He wants to save. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to restore. But you've got to make yourself available to him. In the beginning, the earth, the Bible said, was Without form and void, darkness covered the face of the deep. All these things were happening in the very beginning. That's how it was until God spoke the world into existence. What he's saying tonight, he can speak life into you. He can open up the heavens and pour down the rains upon the dry ground. He can open up the heavens and send refreshing waters over your soul. He wants to send renewal and revival and refreshing, but you've got to be hungry and you've got to be thirsty. He's not going to bless those that are not hungry and thirsty for him. You've got to go after God. I mean, seek him with all your heart, he said, and then you will find him. Ask, knock, and seek, and you'll get a hold of him. He's waiting for us to make the move toward him. He's not going to run and jump on you as you're walking out of the church. But when you come to him like the prodigal son, he'll meet you halfway. You draw nigh to him, he said. He'll draw nigh to you. Would you stand with me, please, all over the house tonight? Thank God tonight for his word. That God wants to end the famine in our life. I don't care for dryness or deadness. I don't want a dead church. I don't want dry church services. I don't like to hear dry sermons and dry songs and dry fellowship. I want to see the blessings of God flowing mightily throughout his house among his people. I've been praying God not only fill these altars, flood these altars with people, but let the altars be flooded with tears as people weep their way to victory. There's such a thing as godly sorrow of repentance calling upon God when people pray. When my people pray, he says, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's when I hear from heaven. That's when I forgive sin, and that's when I heal the land. Would you come with me tonight all over the church? Let's find a place to pray, and let's do that. Let's humble ourselves before him tonight and receive the touch we need from him.